Hi, this is Bashar Kumsaya at the University of Florida, and I am here to discuss with you my most recent article regarding the development of a new quality scale for cohort studies to be used for systematic reviews and meta-analysis. An important part of doing a systematic review and a meta-analysis is to rate the quality of the studies to be included. And there are a lot of scales that can be used to do this, specifically if you're looking at randomized trials. However, if you're looking at cohort studies, there are a lot less scales to be used. And based on my extensive personal review of doing these for many years, I found that there was no easy, efficient scale that can be used for cohort studies. And within the field of gastroenterology, but also in, in outside of gastroenterology, cohort studies are very common, in fact, much more common than randomized control trials, because obviously they are easier and cheaper to conduct. And so it's important to have an efficient scale, and a scale that is easy to use, but also easy to understand. And that's why we developed this uh, quality assessment score, and I think you will like it a lot. This score or the scale went through an extensive validation process as described in this article. And we found it to be very efficient to use, meaning it took less, uh, it took about two minutes to conduct this scale. So once you have read the article, it will take you about two to three minutes to scale uh, to score this article based on the scale. It was also easy to understand and easy to follow. And the uh, final scoring makes sense and is easy to follow. If you get an F on an exam, then you have failed or on this end, in this case, you have a low quality of study. If you score less than 60% or six out of 10. If you score more than, uh, if you score eight or more out of 10, meaning you get an A or a B in a regular exam, then your study is of high quality. And if you score 60 to 70 percent, then your study is of moderate quality. So as you can see, this is intuitive and it makes sense to the reader and to the physician. It takes uh, into account that physicians and researchers don't have 20 minutes or so for each study to assess their quality. Rather, they want something that is efficient, but is also validated and easy to understand. And this is what we have tried to do in this case. I wanted to point out several important aspects of the scale that I think you will find um, helpful to you. Uh, one of them is question number nine, which is a post hoc analysis, meaning once you have done the study and put this in a meta-analysis, if you find that the effect estimate is more than eight to 10 times the uh, estimated, uh, the predicted estimate, then you could consider uh, down rating this study and ultimately it could be excluded. This can help lower your heterogeneity uh, and it can also change the results of the final studies as we have published uh, in our analysis. Uh, another important aspect is that if your primary outcome is the same as the primary outcome of the study, then you get a, an extra point and if it's not, then you get a, a negative point, meaning uh, in a recent uh, meta-analysis, I looked at the prevalence of Barrett's esophagus after bariatric surgery. So if a study design was done such that they specifically wanted to look at Barrett's esophagus after bariatric surgery, then their outcome, their primary outcome is the same as mine, and therefore that study got a point. However, if somebody designed a study to look at something else, let's say esophagitis, and not Barrett's esophagus as a primary endpoint, then my primary endpoint in doing the meta-analysis and the study's primary endpoint are different, and therefore a point was not awarded to this kind of a study. So those are some of the important uh, aspects of the scale. And now I would like to show you how we can use this. Feel free, of course, to uh, email me uh, if you have any questions or concerns. So here is what our scale looks like. Notice that this is only one page and it, it has nine questions. Um, you will be asked to enter your um, study 
information, meaning the first author and the year of publication to identify the study, and your initials. Of course, this will be done by two independent reviewers. Here you will enter the final score. As you see, that there are uh, four domains, and we will look at the first one, which is study design. The first question is, what is the study design? This is usually clearly mentioned under the methods section. Is this a prospective study, in which case you get a one point? Is this a retrospective study, in which case you get zero points? And or is this a retrospective analysis of a prospective cohort, which again should receive zero points? The second question is, was this study conducted in a single center or in multiple centers? We argue that if your study was conducted in multiple centers, then it takes a lot more effort and coordination to do, and it will likely be a higher quality study, and therefore we have given it two points. Whereas if it's a single center study, we decided to give it one point. Question number three asks, is, this, is the primary outcome of the study the same as the primary outcome of your review? And I've mentioned this before, that if it is the same, then you should choose yes, and you get a point. If it's not the same, then you choose a no, or you can always choose unclear. Are the primary outcome measurements valid? For example, if the primary outcome, as I said before, is the prevalence of birds esophagus, was this measured by endoscopy and biopsies, which we know are valid ways to look for Barrett's esophagus? Are the interventions and procedures or treatments of interest clearly detailed in the methods section? So, in, in for example, following this Barrett's esophagus example, the procedure here is endoscopy. Did they tell you how they did the endoscopy? Did they tell you how they did the biopsies? Uh, what kind of scopes? What kind of experience they had in doing this? Uh, if this was not a procedural uh, study, if it was an intervention or treatment, are they clearly described in the methods section? And that's an important aspect. Of course, you get one if it is and zero if it's not. Next, we're going to look at the included patients and their characteristics. Does the study clearly describe including consecutive patients or all patients? That's important because when we're looking at retrospective studies or chart review, if this is not mentioned, meaning that they tried to include all patients who came to the center or consecutive patients who came for something, then by nature, the sample is going to be biased. The next question or question number seven is the proportion of patients who refuse to participate who are, or who were not included in the study less than 20% of the overall population. So let's say this is a prospective study and the, the study, about 50% of people who are approached to be included in this uh, prospective study said no. We would argue that this may be of lower quality and would give it less points. Again, if you're doing a chart review, a retrospective chart review, and most and many people, a large number of people from the chart reviewed were not included, then this could be a red flag and therefore that study would be rated down. Question number eight talks about the description of patient characteristics. Does the results include a clear description of patient characteristics? This is usually described in table number one looking at patients' uh, age distribution, gender distribution, comorbidities, etc. And so this is important to be included in any study. And of course, if you don't have that, you'll be already done. The last one is the one that we talked about as an outlier, which I previously mentioned. Is there evidence that the study may be an outlier? Or does the primary effect estimate of the study vary from expected by 8 to 10 points? This can be done after the meta-analysis. I've discussed this before, and I'm going to show you an, a real example of how this was done. So if you look at this study here that was published in GIE, these are seven cohort studies that were included in this meta-analysis published in January. And notice that the final odds ratio was 4.82, and it was statistically significant. Lower limit is 1.65, upper limit is 14.04. However, these two studies, as you can see, have an effect estimate of 38, odds ratio of 38, odds ratio of 148. Compared to the uh, effect estimate reported here, which is about 5, this is a lot larger 
than expected. And these are the, the, the two studies here. So when we rated these two studies on our scale, they both rated at about six, even though one of them was an abstract, and we were not supposed to use it in an abstract. So when we downrated them as an outliers, and therefore they dropped it to a score of less than six, meaning they were likely of poor quality, and should be excluded from the analysis. When we did that, note that the effect estimate went down with an odds ratio of 2.33. And the lower limit now crosses 1. Because these outlying studies were moving the effect estimate far out, even though it was not statistically significant, but there are so much of an outlier that they moved it above the statistical significance. And this also lower, uh, lowered the uh, heterogeneity from 84% to 72%. So this feature, I believe, is going to be very important for your study.